So here I will give you all the details you ever want to know about transform architecture. I, I will dig very deep into it. Uh, and then at the end, I will give you also a high level overview how the transform architecture is currently taking over all the different communities where deep learning happens. Um, and the, you should know that there are a lot of variants of transformers that have been proposed afterwards. After the original paper, I'm not going to talk about the variants, except very briefly for one minute at the end. I'm, this is all about the original transform architecture, which still today is like really good. Uh, so first question, um, who of you has implemented the transformer architecture yourself? Can you raise hands? Okay, so for, okay, very few, that's nice, because for you the first two thirds might be boring, you may know this already, but for all of the others, this should be interesting. Um, I want to do it like this, you can interrupt me uh, whenever something is unclear. I try to go slow and make all the details clear. But at some point, I will also be like, okay, now we need to move on in the interest of time. All right, so enough of the introduction. Um, first, the background, which you may have partially seen in the previous lecture. This is how it used to be in the machine learning in the different communities until a few years ago. Um, so you have these different communities that for a long time have been somewhat separate even, like the computer vision, uh, natural language processing, speech, maybe translation was even slightly separate from natural language processing and reinforcement learning. And each kind of over time developed their ideal deep learning architecture that is somewhat based on what people think of or what people think makes sense for the data they use. Like in computer vision, you have CNNs, which you have heard a lot about before. Uh, where you would think, okay, like if I have this robot, I want to recognize its hand. It shouldn't matter if the hand is on the bottom right or on the top left. It's the robot hand. It looks the same. So they kind of try to design architectures that are somewhat uh, translation equivariant. So react the same no matter where in the image you apply them. And this led over time to convolutional neural networks and residual networks. Um, similar story in natural language processing. Uh, most languages you read left to right, character by character, or maybe not even most languages, but those where they were most uh, NLP researchers in, like English. Um, so they, over time they designed the architecture to be like this, to take like one character at a time or something slightly more complicated from left to right, like take it in, process it a bit, take the next one in, process it a bit, and so on and so on. And this is RNNs or LSTMs, and they have been dominant in this field for a while. A uh, similar story that I'm going to skip the details in speech. Um, there was also yet another different specialized model, which is way outdated now. Uh, and in translation, there was this sequence to sequence type of model that takes the whole original or source language uh, in and then computes something and then outputs the whole destination language. Um, and I'm going to skip over RL for now. However, in the last two ish years, roughly, basically over COVID time, more or less. Um, the transform architecture has been replacing everything, and now it looks a bit more like this. Um, it's not the complete truth. The communities still use a bit of their classical architectures, but this is slight exaggeration of what it currently looks like. This picture, if you haven't seen it yet, you will see it many times. Like the rest of my slides are basically only this picture again and again and again. This is the transform architecture. This is the original picture from the paper. Um, and yeah, it's, it's reused everywhere. All right, so yeah, the, the next parts, like at first, the, there is one key component of the transform architecture, like the convnets convolution is the key component, and here a thing called attention is a key component, so I will spend quite some time to explain attention in detail, and then I will move on to explain the whole transform architecture, which makes use of attention a lot uh, in detail, and then I will show how it's used in these different communities. All right. Um, so it kind of all started in hindsight with this 2014 paper um, from, I can never pronounce his name, Dmitry Badano, I guess. Um, it was in translation, uh, and it was all about aligning characters or words between source and target language. Um, they had this this picture that is very hard to understand, like those of you who know exactly how attention works may be guessing that this may be attention. Um, but yeah, this was hard to parse. And the main goal was this, like here you have the 
a French sentence, um, blah, 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 and here you have the English translation, blah, blah, blah. And the, the whole goal of this paper was to automatically learn which words uh, generate which ones in the other language, or which ones you need to basically pay attention to in the source language to generate a target language. Um, so wait, there is one nice example. Um, this one, uh, if you know in English, there is only the, and it's all the, like the man, the woman, blah, blah, blah. In French, it's le, la, masculine, feminine. So you need to know what word comes next in order to decide if you're going to put le or la, or even worse, this l apostrophe, which is shorthand of le or la, which happens sometimes depending on which word comes next. And so they, they, they kind of big, big breakthrough here was that their model with this mysterious component that is now called attention, learn to automatically, in order to generate like this L apostrophe, to look at both the and man, because both of them are needed to know this. Uh, so that's why it was jointly learning to align and translate. And they kind of named it attention, but the word attention appears three times in the paper uh, and just is kind of the background as some vague thing, but not really as a core thing. And then it took another three years for this attention to be like used more and more, and then eventually used as the core component of this transform architecture. And the transform architecture's paper is called Attention is All You Need, um, because it's like architecture all around attention. And that was the key paper that made the transformer a uh, big thing. So what is the attention? What does it look like? Um, I like to give the intuition. It's like a dictionary lookup. Like, you know, in Python, you have your dictionary data structure, you can, you have a key and you get the result what was in there. Uh, I mean, what value was stored with that key. And attention is kind of the same data structure, if you will, uh, but this is in neural networks. Everything needs to be differentiable and to end, you cannot have any discrete things. And the discrete is like in the dictionary, you know, you have this key or that key and nothing in between. This is kind of a soft version of it. So imagine you have like soft keys and you can query multiple mixtures of keys and then get a mixture of values back. It is like the vague intuition that you should have in mind. And now let's look at the details, how it actually works. Um, so yeah, you have this, uh, you have three, three things that appear in attention. You have the query the set of keys and the set of values which correspond to these keys. So key zero and value zero, oh, sorry, here, uh, go together. Um, all of these things are vectors, like float vectors of some dimension, let's say 128, um, right? And then basically these keys and, and ev all of these are learned, they appear out of somewhere. For now, we will see later where they come from. But for now, let's say they are, you're somewhere in the middle of a model and you have this query vector, key vector, and value vectors. Um, and and that's, that's how you do the lookup. Like you take the query vector and you compare it to all of the key vectors that, that are stored there in this dictionary in quotes. Uh, how do you compare it? For example, the dot product. With the dot product, the more similar the vectors are, the higher is the result, right? And the more dissimilar they are, the lower is the result of a dot product. Um, or like, similar or pointing into the same direction, let's say. Um, and so you take the query vector, you do dot product with each individual key. For each dot product, you get one number as an answer. And so you get as many numbers as you have keys. And these numbers are called the attention weights. I draw them here, right? Some will be high when the query is very similar to the key and some will be low when they are dissimilar. Uh, this is shown here on the left a bit more formally. Uh, then we take these numbers and we normalize them. Normalization we always do in, with the softmax in deep learning, or almost always. It's just a function that you give it a vector of numbers and it turns them into another vector of numbers that sums up to one that you could see as a probability distribution. Um, and so the numbers that were high here become closer to one. For example, let's say you have these attention weights and you have one huge number like 99999 and a lot of smaller numbers like minus thousand, minus thousand and so on. Then after softmax, this becomes the one hot vector almost, where you have almost zero, almost zero, almost one, almost zero, almost zero and so on, right? And if you have two high numbers, then those two become almost 0 0.5 after the softmax and the rest becomes zeros, right? And then you can maybe already see where this is going. Then to create your output, 
you multiply, you basically do weighted sum of the values where the weights are these attention weights after the softmax, right? So if the query is very, very similar to one key, let's say to this one, what this means is here we will have the weighted sum with almost zero times this, plus almost zero times this, plus almost one times this, plus almost zero times this, and so on and so on. And so the result will be essentially this one vector, right? And if the query is similar to three different keys, then the result will be uh, average of the three values corresponding to these keys, almost. It's always soft, there's always a little bit of other stuff mixed in such that you can have gradients, they can uh, backpropagate and so on. Uh, this is what I've shown here in, in the formula, a little bit more formally. Uh, right, so this is how essentially the attention mechanism works. Um, now the question is, where do these queries and keys and values come from? Um, I'm gonna go one step back, but there will be another question, where does this come from? Uh, so you have some, some input, set of vectors, and later you will see where those come from, uh, but they are then transformed with a learnable matrix, just linear projection, into keys, and with another learnable mat matrix into values. And these are like the parameters that you learn, WK and WV, and, oops, and the queries also come from a similar thing. You have another input, and then you just linearly project it, and you have your query. Uh, and then the output, you will process it further somehow in your architecture. Um, sometimes, the query, this is a side note, it will be more clear later, but sometimes the query are also derived from the same input as the keys and the values. So you have another WQ, which generates this, and then this is called self-attention. So there is attention and self-attention. And then the transformer, both are used, yeah. Yeah. No, they, the values are weighted by the product of keys and queries. The product of keys and queries chooses how you do the weighted sum of the values, these weights. And then, yes, the output then depends on the queries, the keys, and the values all together. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so the, how the attention mechanism combines queries, keys, and values into outputs, that one should be clear to you now, hopefully. Uh, where these things come from, uh, like putting them into context, will come later. Okay? Good. Because I lied, this is not the attention, there is more to it. Um, there's a few more complexities until we get to the actual attention, how it's implemented. Uh, the first thing is there is not just one query. There's usually a whole bunch of queries. Here I show four of them, and then they are packed into a matrix for efficiency, and then you end up with the attention matrix, actually, one row for each query here. Right? And then the outputs are also a matrix. Again, four of them for these four queries that I show. Um, this is an easy thing, like basically what was vector before becomes a matrix now, and then we just have more of them. Uh, that is one thing. Another thing is in practice, everybody uses what's called multi-head attention. Um, that is often showed with this picture, which I hate because I think it doesn't display it nicely, but essentially it's not just one attention, but you do many attentions instead of one. Um, I prefer this picture because this shows exactly what you do. So you have your queries as shown up here, and now you cut them into pieces, let's say into eight pieces or three pieces as I show here. Uh, along their, um, well, I never called this dimension, along their depth dimension, let's say. Or basically this, what I said, these are vectors, they are 128 dimensional, for example, so here you would cut them across these 128 dimensions into three shorter vectors in this case. And then you actually have three attention matrices if you cut it into three pieces, and these pieces are called head. They, that's why it's called multi-head attention. So I should say these three heads. And then you have three attention matrices, which lead to three different output matrices, which are also shorter because you, you cut everything, not just the queries. You cut also the keys into pieces and the values into pieces. 
Um, right, and then you stitch these pieces back together and you have the original size. Um, so this is multi-head attention, which is what people actually use. Why? It just works better in practice. It gives more flexibility to the operation. Um, and taking all of this together, we get to the expression uh, that you usually see, uh, which summarizes everything that I just said. So the dot product between a query, vec a query matrix and key matrix in this case, um, and then ignore this technicality, and then you take the softmax to get this attention matrix, and oops, what happened? Okay, and then you take the the weighted average, basically by which is done by multiplying this attention matrix with the values, and then you get your outputs. Okay, and this is the full attention that is usually implemented and used. So far, so good. Hopefully, yes. Okay. Um, right, so this is your chance to ask about attention. Next step, I go to the transformer and just use it and assume you all know it, yeah? Yeah, yeah, um, that's a technicality, but the technicalities are important when you want to train these models. Um, so there can be an issue, like if the softmax gets very close to one hot, uh, so to, as I mentioned before in the example, very high numbers, 9999 and then minus 10,000 everywhere or something like this, uh, then it becomes almost a step function and gradient of the step function is gigantic and then your models explode. Uh, so you don't actually want it to like, conceptually you would like it to pick out one value, but in reality you don't want it to be that extreme. Uh, and so you basically can mitigate this slightly by just dividing it by something. You know, this makes all the values smaller, so you're further away from this. Uh, and this is just a heuristic that over time has established to be nice to use. Um, you divide by the square root of the dimension of the key, which is in my example that I said this 128. Uh, and this makes it more robust across when you change this hyperparameter. Um, yeah. But for, for conceptually understanding, it doesn't matter. You can ignore this. But for actually implementing, it does matter. All right, any more question to attention? Yes. Uh, you mentioned some point that for many keys, when we don't select one key, we use the average. Uh, there are there can be collisions for two different sets of keys and values, right? So, is there some intuition that you could elaborate a bit more? There? I'm not sure I understand the question. So, when we don't select just one key based huh? on intention, but more than one. Yeah. So, let's say in like the three. Yes, for the first query and the second query, we might end up with the same average number. Mm. So, is there some uh, some mechanism that uh, yeah. helps for collisions? To avoid collisions? Um, yes, this basically never happened in reality because we randomly initialize these weight matrices for the different uh, pieces differently and the inputs are always different. So, in any healthy training, this basically doesn't happen. If it happens, you, you have an issue in training and like maybe you initialize things too similarly or maybe your inputs are super mega correlated and somehow wrong in the pre-processing or something like that. But there is no explicit mechanism in attention to uh, care about this. All right, then oh, you had that. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, is there some biological inspiration in this attention mechanism? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't like these biological inspiration things. <laughs> is it possible to use the attention wakes directly as the output, ignoring the values? It would be a different model, but is it going to work? Or Yeah, I mean, you could do this in some sense they are the outputs of this part and then used by that part and you could imagine doing something else with them. Okay. I'm not immediately aware, like when you ask this question now, no model jumps to my mind that uses this, but I don't see why not in principle if you have a good idea of how to okay. use it. Thank you. All right, okay, last one. 
I think you need the microphone for recording. Considering multi-headed attention, I didn't get the uh, the advantage of or the difference between the second and the third picture on the right hand side. So what is ah. the significance or the advantage of splitting this answer into various they, so they are the same. They both explain the multi-headed self-attention. You typically see this picture. I find it a bit misleading because it doesn't really show what's going on and I prefer to explain with this picture. But I wanted to show that one because that's what you typically see in other lectures and textbooks. So the second one is just like the individual, the, all the blocks and the individual answers which are concatenated in the second yeah, part. Yeah. So and then they, they typically okay. don't show them actually being smaller, which is the case in reality. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, I said last one. So let's go on now to the transform architecture. Like, How is this attention used? But there are so many things in this architecture that it will take a few slides before I get to actually using attention. Um, so the first thing to know is that this architecture has been proposed also in the translation literature, like the first paper that I mentioned uh, just three years later. And so this is the full transformer, which has an input sentence and should generate an output sentence in another language, right? Uh, and then later we will see how different pieces of the transformer architecture alone may be used in other contexts when you don't want to translate something. But for, and you, for example, you don't have an input language, you just want to generate language or things like that. So let's go through this piece by piece. Um, the first thing is on the input side. Uh, I said you have an input language. Uh, actually, let me ask again, like who here knows pretty well about uh, text tokenization and like how the input is transformed into vectors? Okay, cool. So still a lot of you will learn something here. Um, then I will also take my time here. So as input, there is text, uh, right? Which is just a set of characters. Uh, so I take this example, the detective investigated and it can be any arbitrary length. Um, and somehow, like all of these models, all of deep learning always works with vectors of floats. So somehow we need to transform this text into meaningful vectors of floats. Uh, and this is what this uh, tokenization and embedding do. Um, the first step is to take this sentence and somehow cut it into pieces which are called tokens. Uh, you can imagine that if it's English, it's, it could be cut into words. Uh, it could be cut into characters. The words thing becomes more difficult when you have languages without spaces, like I think Chinese doesn't have space, for example, right? Um, so what nowadays is done in reality is using a complex tokenizer, which cuts the sentence into pieces which may be words or may be parts of words or things like that. And this is often nowadays even learned itself on some large amount of text in some language or in many languages, such as to optimally compress it or whatnot. Uh, but it can become a complex beast nowadays. And so just see it as a black box tokenizer, which cuts a sentence into tokens. So I give here the example of it cutting two things, like very common words are often cut into the whole word, and then others may be cut into like pieces like this. This is a made up example. I'm not saying there is a tokenizer that exactly tokenizes like this, um, but that's what it typically looks like. And then each tokenizer has a large vocabulary that it comes with, which are basically all the tokens that it knows and that it would ever generate. Uh, so for example, all the words that it knows, all the words that it knows. This is large, usually like 32,000 or 250,000 or something like that. Um, and so each token generated corresponds to one entry in this large vocabulary. And we just sort them, however, we don't really care, but then each, it means each token corresponds to an integer, right? The index into this vocabulary. So we're almost there. Um, the next thing is we can have a big learnable matrix of floats that has as many entries or as many vectors as vocabulary size. Right. And uh, how long is this vector is up to us to choose? Let's say 128. I just like this number. Um, and then these are randomly initialized and to learn through the process of like your training, they are learned. And these are then called the, uh, they used to be called word embeddings. They should now be called token embeddings. Um, and this is how we get to a set of float vectors. 
at first they are completely random, but you have one float vector per token that exists, right? So one float vector for detective. Um, so that's how we transform text into floats. Um, then there is another thing. Um, now we have this sequence of floats, or sequence of, of float vectors, sorry, uh, which is the sequence of tokens. Um, but we will later use self-attention with them. And if you think back how this works, uh, one sec. Um, self-attention is actually permutation invariant. It, it doesn't care about the order of the keys and values that you show it, right? So we need another thing to keep the order of the words somehow in the model. And then there was a question there. Wait, you need the... I, I just want to clarify, um, what's the difference between word and token? Uh, there are, token can be a word, it can be a piece of a word, like for example here, investigated is a word and it could, gets cut into three tokens, invest, igate, and add. Thank you. Yep. All right, so we need to, we have the sentence transformed into vect uh, vectors of floats, but we need to remember also which where in the sentence was it, right? Because you can easily imagine changing the order of words in a sentence makes a complete difference. Um, and so that's what the position encoding comes in. Um, and this may be slightly tricky to get, so I'm going to try to give you an example or intuition of it, and in reality it's a bit more complicated. Um, Imagine all of these float vectors that corresponds to like your whole vocabulary, right? Uh, imagine they are all somehow, uh, like imagine them now as a point cloud uh, in abstract high dimensional space and every point uh, corresponds to one token, right? And imagine they are somehow close, centered near zero and they, they form a ball that doesn't go too far off. Let's say maximum distance to zero is one. Um, now, how can you add position information to this stuff? Uh, well, for example, you can say, okay, the first token, I always add 10 to the vectors. That means basically this ball, you move it here in space. And the second token, I always add 20. Then any word that appears in the second token is here in space. And the third one, I always add 30. So the third will always be here in space. So the next parts that process this just know by, okay, this is here in space, so I know this was the, th the second word, right? That is the intuition. In reality, it's something more complicated than just a number that gets added here, like it's a bunch of sine, cosine waves or not in high dimensional space that you cannot easily imagine the way I gave you, but this is the intuition behind it. So positional encoding is just some complex thing. Sometimes it's actually learned what should be added. Uh, sometimes it's hand engineered. In the original one here, it was hand engineered. But yeah, um, that's the extent I want to dig into this one. So then at this point, we have the inputs, which is still like a set of vectors, of float vectors, which are the tokens plus their position embeddings added together already. And now we do the first part of the operation, which is multi headed self attention. Um, in this case, let's say it looks like this. We have our tokens here, uh, right? And they become the queries, they become the keys, and they become the values. Uh, and then these get combined in multi-head self-attention. And then for each one, we get an output. Again, right? Because for each vector generates one query uh, by just being multiplied by a learnable weight matrix. Um, and then, since this is self-attention, this query that is generated by a vector looks at the keys that are generated by all of these vectors. So the way you can interpret what it's doing is that each token gets the chance to look around, like what other tokens are there in the sentence, and kind of see, okay, there's a little bit of this, like maybe the... Uh, and over time, they learn what to look for. So for example, maybe invest will look for if there is a egate add, or if there is a add, because then it knows, oh, I mean investigated, or oh, I mean invested, and stuff like that. And over time, this gets higher and higher level, uh, and it actually starts to look around for like whole concepts of what is going on and so on. Um, and then the output is as many vectors as we had as inputs. So you can think of this is like a slightly, the token updated some information 
uh, after having seen what else is going on. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is the multi head self attention. It's like looking around what else is there in the input. And then comes this part uh, point wise MLP or feed forward uh, model. Um, have you actually, who knows what is the MLP? Okay, some hands are not up. So it's basically this formula. Uh, your input is multiplied by a learnable matrix and there is a bias. Then there is some nonlinearity. And then again, multiplied by some learnable matrix and the bias and that becomes your output. Um, so it's the simplest model that existed in deep learning since forever. Um, and this one is applied to each token individually without looking around to any other tokens that are there. And this one is usually huge. Um, so this is what I show here. So the, let's say these 128 dimensions, as I always say in the example, right? Then this may go up to multiply it by a matrix that pushes it into 2000 dimensional space. Then you have some linearity and then another matrix that pushes it back to the same dimension, 128. Um, what does this do intuitively? Um, here, basically each token can spend a lot of time and compute to think for itself, like ponder what it has just seen before. So think of the self-attention collecting information, what else is going on, but it doesn't have much capacity to think for itself. You know, it's just looking similarities to things it's looking for and then taking weighted average of these. Uh, and here, it now can take the time to process all of the stuff it has collected. Um, and there, it's not completely clear what actually happens there for real in actual models, but there have been recently a series of papers that try to investigate this, and they concluded that very likely this is also these matrices is where some kind of world knowledge is stored in, in language models. So for example, here it would be stored in that, okay, I have investigated, uh, then it may be looking for things like the word detective, uh, have I seen detective beforehand, uh, for example, and things like that, or things like uh, the president of US in previously was uh, Trump and before that was Obama and whatnot. These things seem to be stored in these, like they are kind of learned to be knowledge bases. Um, okay, and so, yeah, so first self attention, look around what's going on and then update what you should be thinking based on what you've seen and just general world knowledge that you have gotten through training. Um, this is also where most of the parameters in the transform architecture are stored. You can imagine, right, if it wants to remember everything, like all the world knowledge. And this is where people try to make the model even larger. There is a trend to make the models larger and larger and larger because they work better and better and better. They can absorb more and more and more knowledge. Uh, and a lot of people focus on making this part larger and you can see there is like a whole community which tries to make this one absolutely gigantic and then they go and try to make it sparse uh, and things like that. So I'm not going to go into any of these details, just know that this is where a lot of the compute and the scaling up happens. Uh, and just a small detail, some people like to call it one by one convolution because it's kind of the same weights are applied to each token but separately. Um, all right, then an important little detail that, is, uh, that I kind of skipped here, there is always these connections and add and norm. These are called residual connections uh, and layer normalization. They're actually super important. Um, they come originally from ResNets, which was a computer vision paper, uh, which added them. They just mean this. Uh, you have some module here or here, and basically, instead of just taking the output of this module, you add the output of the module back to its input. Uh, so in principle, the module could learn to be identity function and then this would be no op, nothing happens, uh, right? This was in the original ResNet paper. It was shown that this somehow makes the optimization process much better. This was the first time we were able to train without problems actually deep models. Like the ResNet was 50, 100, 150 layers deep. And previously we were stuck with like VGG managed to train 16 layers and then with a ton of hex 19 layers. Uh, so this residual connection actually makes a world of difference on being able to train these models instead of them blowing up, getting nuns and the infs and so on. 
Um, the interpretation, again, there is like two pictures of the same thing. Uh, one that is usually shown that I don't like and one that I prefer. So this one is usually shown and it's like, yeah, okay, you have this block and you add the input back to the output. Uh, I prefer this one. Notice it's literally the exact same picture, just aligned differently. Um, but this one gives a different impression, at least to me. Uh, it means you have this input and the block kind of takes this input, looks at it and suggests a change to this input. So currently now, now the, the input like these vectors is the core thing and the block just suggests some small difference to make to it. All right, so this is what the residual block means. Now, none of these layers, as you usually learn or even saw before, is always the layer has some input and then it does processing and then there is a completely new output. Well, with residual connections, this changes completely. You have some input, the layer does some pro processing and suggests how to change this input slightly. Uh, and this, you do it many times over and over, over the depth. Um, then there is the, so, Skip connections super important and they don't come from transformers, but they are used there too. Uh, and then there is this uh, layer normalization. This is a thing, some people like it, some people hate it. Um, it's essentially normalizing the activations, like centering them, um, what is it called? U unit variancing them um, and things like that. And this makes a lot of things harder to interpret when you try to dig into what's going on, but it makes the models usually much more stable to train. Uh, so this is a kind of necessity to have it. In transformer world, there exist uh, two variants that are both still argued for by different people. One is called post-norm and pre-norm. The question is just where do you put this normalization? The original with post-norm basically puts it here after the plus. And the one with pre-norm basically puts it here before the residual block is taken in. It's not clear yet which one is better, uh, but just know if you see post-norm or pre-norm, it means this difference. All right. So this is the encoder part of the model that I've talked about. So this takes the input sentence and you do this repetition of attention to look around and then feed forward or MLP to process and you repeat this uh, many times. Uh, in transformers, you, we usually give, we have a few variants of the model that differ in size and how slow they are, but also how good they are. And often we use the name base for some like medium-ish and then large, and then there are others. Um, and typical numbers is for base model, you repeat this six times, for large model, 12 times. Um, so this is the encoder part that heavily processes the input sentence that you want to translate. Um, and then remember everywhere I said the input of each block is always the same size as the output, uh, even by necessity because you have this skip where you just add it back to it. Uh, and so it means here we have as many float vectors as output as we had input as inputs after the tokenization. Um, but so far, we just looked at the input sentence. We processed it quite a lot. We understand like, okay, this is about a detective that somehow investigates stuff. Um, and this is all stored in these now very high level uh, representations or vectors, but this has nothing to do with translation. We didn't generate anything in any other language yet. And this is where the second half comes in uh, here that I'm gonna go through. And this is the decoder. Just the... I may take one question if you have about the encoder, otherwise I move on to the decoder. Yeah. Is there a, a maximum length of the sentence that you can input or is it like a RNN that you have uh, this yeah. recurrence? Uh, no, usually there is a maximum length and this is set to something like 128 <laughs> um, and, and that's it. And then a uh, talk uh, sentence may be cut after this. Remember this 128 can be a lot, right? Because one token can be a whole word on its own, for example. And I'm just making up the 128. I, it depends heavily on the model. Um, and everything that is shorter is padded with a special padding token. Um, at the end, you will see the generator will still be able to generate arbitrary length things. And there is tricks to go around this. But in principle, the architecture itself has a fixed length. 
uh, set of vectors. Thanks. All right, then uh, the decoder. So now we want to generate uh, the sentence in the Lua language. And this kind of sounds impossible at first, at least to me, uh, because we want to model some, the probability distribution over some output, in this case, over the basically all the possible sentences in the target language. We want the probability, probability distribution over them, but conditioned on the input, on the source sentence. Um, like the English one, the detective investigated. Uh, this ideally we would like, and then we have probability over all possible translations of it, and we do something with it, like we sample the most likely one, and we provide this. Or maybe we want some diversity, and we sample the three most likely ones and propose the three of them, or whatever. Uh, this is the goal. Um, it sounds impossible, but there is one nice thing. There is this uh, chain rule of probability, uh, that you can decompose this. Like imagine this Z is now the sequence of tokens in the target output language. Um, and now you can decompose it into the probability of the first token given the input times the probability of the second token given the input and the first token that you just selected uh, times the probability of the third token and uh, given the input, the first and the second token and so on. And this is just the pure like mathematical uh, formula that is applied and this is exact equality. So what this means is we can do this, not for everything at each time you have to select one token, but if we select one token after another, we can actually do this. Um, so one thing to notice here, so, so this is what we need to do. Um, if we want to generate the text. And each of these P means that we apply the whole model here, this decoder model, um, a full pass through the model. And then it has, wait, I should have on the next slide. Yes, here. Um, and so this X that is conditioned on is a side input, basically what the encoder produced. It's like a high level information, uh, highly processed variant of the source sentence comes from the encoder. And then these Z's, imagine we already sampled and selected the two first tokens. We are in the middle of the generation. Um, then these Z's are the two tokens that we selected previously based on their probability. Maybe we just took the most probable one, but there are more advanced techniques too, uh, right? So, so then at this point, these are inputs to the decoder also. Uh, and so the decoder sees those two, sees this X, and needs to generate a probability over all possible next tokens. So a probability vector the same size as the vocabulary of our tokenizer. Right? And then we can decide what to do with this probability. Maybe just take the most probable next token, um, maybe do something more advanced given the previous ones. And there are, these are called uh, decoding techniques and the uh, beam search is for probably the most popular one, but there are many and it's not yet clear what is the best. And I'm not gonna go through them. Um, but this is like the input output that we need on the decoder. Um, and then we do a forward pass for each of these gener each token that we generate one after another. Uh, and what does this forward pass now look like? Uh, well, at first, okay, I went too fast over this, but at first we have the, the same story, like the tokens that we already generated so far, they are embedded and transformed into these float vectors and we add the position encoding. Uh, then we have, uh, again, the self-attention. Notice there is like the keyword masked. Um, this is a detail. I don't want to dig too deep into this. I think it may also be covered well in the next, in a few days NLP lecture that you have, but I also don't want to skip it because it's part of Transformer. Um, so as I said, the, if you want to generate a sentence, you basically need the forward pass for every single token of the target sentence. And this would be excessively slow to train. So there is a nice trick on how we can train for the whole sentence simultaneously. Um, and that means in the self-attention, for the token that I'm currently generating, it should only see the previous ones and it shouldn't see the next ones, right? Uh, according to this, uh, sorry, to, to this formula, right? So we can take the self-attention matrix and just mask out, like multiply by zero, the entries that may not be looked at. 
and then they will never be part of this average and they are essentially not seen, even though they go through this compute, but there's all zeros. Uh, and by doing this way, we can basically forward the whole sentence and just have like a triangular attention matrix only. Um, all right, this, is, this one is the part where it's fine if you didn't fully get it. Uh, it's not that, it is somewhat important, but I think it's, I cannot cover enough uh, if I go into full, full detail on this. Um, one thing to note is that this is a trick that only works at training time. At generation time, it doesn't work uh, because you need to actually sample one token before sending it uh, through, through the model again to generate the next one. So you need to go one by one. At training time, you don't need to because you don't sample because they are in your training set. They just are there in the data already. Um, right, and this is why generation, auto, this is called autoregressive generation. And this is why it, this is slow, at least with transformers. Because for each thing you generate, you need a full forward pass. Um, all right, but so far, there was only processing of the tokens generated already with this self-attention, with this little detail of the mask. We still need to take in the source sentence that we actually want to translate into this, right? Uh, and this goes through attention again. Um, this is the original attention, but nowadays it's often explicitly called cross-attention. Uh, how we do this is the... Sec, yes. The queries come from the decoder now, from the tokens in the decoder, and the keys and values, the dictionary that we look at, are generated from the encoders. Um, variables or, or vectors, right? So that means the decoder who is currently thinking about what token to generate next, now generates a query that looks up into the encoder's uh, dictionary, if you will. So it's, this is the point where the decoder looks at what do I actually need to translate here um, via attention. Uh, and this is exactly the attention from this original alignment paper. Um, yeah, and this is just then often called cross-attention now because self-attention is so common that people often are lazy and don't say self-attention, but just say attention. And now people feel the need to say, okay, but this is cross-attention, it's not self-attention. So these are the words you will hear commonly. And then we have uh, the same feed-forward layer afterwards, again, to allow for each token to ponder about what it has seen because it has collected two things, like what's already been generated for in the target language and what do I even need to translate? Uh, and now feed forward to kind of think about it. And then we repeat this n times again. These are, this is uh, called a block and we have six or 12 blocks of the decoder. And then at the end, we have just a linear transformation of this token after all of this processing uh, into with output as many numbers or after softmax probabilities as we have vocabulary in the tokenizer. And then this is our distribution over the next token. All right. Yes, so here is a summary. This is animation from the original paper, which I think is quite nice. So here is the encoding. You see the cross attention from everywhere to everywhere in the encoder for a few layers. And in the decoder, there's this just starting token. Um, and then we generate the first one, or we sample the first one, and then it looks around to what's already been generated here. And then it looks at what comes from the encoder and goes through the layers. And at the end here, we get the probability distribution and maybe we sample the next word, which here is arrivé, uh, and so on. And one thing that is worth mentioning at this point is, so this is the end about transformer architecture. Uh, nowadays, whenever you hear transformer or people use transformer, you think about uh, massive compute, lots of waste of compute, tons of data and so on. But actually, the original transformer paper, one of the key things was it was much cheaper and much better than all other translation models that existed back then. So this is a table from the original paper and uh, in terms of flops, like they get SOTA and they get two to three orders of magnitude less compute than uh, previously. So what's good about transformers is you can scale them up a lot because they can ingest so much data with relatively little compute compared to other architectures. Uh, yeah, and at this point, 
I can take another question or two if you want about transformer architecture, because then we will go into the last part, how it's adapted to different tasks. Um, so um, what's the reason of that uh, decrease in compute? Is it because of the matrix operations? Like the base, the basis of the operations of the transformer, I guess, is the multiplication of the matrices that you deal with, I guess, no? This is why, this doesn't matter in terms of flops, mm. all right? If another model does matrix multiplication, is flops too, or convolutions is flops too. Um, the matrix multiply is important because that's like, in all of programming, this is the most efficient piece of code that exists, matrix multiply. So as the more you can use, the better, no matter what device you are on. Um, so this is what makes the flops actually fast in terms of overclock clock time, because the same flops are not always the same speed. Once you actually run them, it depends what operations they are. And if they are mainly in matrix multiply, you win. This is super fast. Um, but here it's not even about speed. There is no wall clock time here. Um, what makes them efficient in terms of flops is that they can Okay, this is kind of wishy-washy, but they can absorb much more data than other architectures, than, for example, convnets or RNNs. So somehow they have much more capacity, and capacity is one of these magic words that are not clearly defined. Regularization is another one. Uh, you hear it often in answers when we don't really know why. Um, but somehow this architecture can digest a lot more data with less compute. Okay, thank you. Hey, um, with transformers, how do you deal with a difference in like sequence length between the input and the output? Yeah, um, here we have this encoder and decoder part, right? Um, so the decoder part, notice that it, it doesn't matter what was the encoder size or length, right? It just looked at it as a lookup table. Um, but the decoder generated one example or one token after another. There is this magic uh, end of sentence token. And whenever it decides to output the end of sentence tokens, we say, okay, this is the end of the sentence, done. Um, and that way the model decides how long a sentence it generates. But practically speaking, in implementation, we, are, we have a maximum number of tokens we pass through it, just because of implementation is better. Um, so there is a maximum length usually imposed by the implementation, but that we set high enough that we can provide more than we want to. And then this is during training and then during inference time, the decoding part in principle, there is no limit. You, as I said, like, right, each, the P of the next token given the previous ones is one forward pass through the model. So it's how many passes you want to do, how patient you want to be until you see this end of sentence token. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, then uh, now you know all about transformers and self-attention, I hope. Oh, one more question there. Thank you for taking it. Um, I'm interested a lot, we're using a lot of transfer learning, of course. Um, I think the most straightforward thing would be to just retrain the last layers in the decoder. But I wonder, are there other parts which might make sense to retrain in a transfer learning matter, like in the encoder, for instance? How would that work? Do you know, have you done experiments? Thank you. Yes. Um, the short answer is you can do anything. Um, and sometimes this is better in that context. Sometimes this is better in this other task and so on. Um, I will show a couple of examples actually next in uh, for language. Um, but yeah, in principle, it's, it depends, like you can fine tune all parts. Some people, uh, for example, try also just fine tuning some parts, like in the layer norm, there are small learnable parameters, uh, biases and scales. Some people showed that, wow, you can even do transfer learning by freezing everything, but just changing these it's, I would say, let's say active investigation, no one true answer. All right, so now I'm gonna go through relatively briefly the different communities, how Transformer is adapted there, because all of that we've seen is just for translation, which is kind of a small part of the whole machine learning spectrum, right? And I'm also not gonna cover all parts because there are tons of applications at the end of the day, and hopefully a bunch of you will introduce Transformers in your applications. 
Mm. All right, so in language, there's like three, I would say, core ways how the transformer is used. Uh, NLP or language modeling nowadays is kind of like translation without the source sentence. So you want to learn the distribution over all sentences, full stop, not conditioned on anything. For example, on the web or on some subset of web pages that you look at or on some domain, like there is medical NLP that look at medical records and they want to, to learn distribution over all sentences in medical records. And once you have such a distribution, you can start using it in different ways. Um, and yeah, here I show a couple of ways, or the most popular ones for natural language. Um, and they are really just reusing pieces of the transform architecture. So for example, here, this is probably the most famous one is GPT. This is a decoder only. So this is the, I took this picture exactly from the previous one we went through, but I just removed a few things. The encoder is gone. And since the encoder is gone, there is no point in cross attention anymore. So that one is gone too. The rest is exactly the same. So it's only the generator part. And the GPT stands for generative pre-training. Um, so it just generates text out of the blue and that's it, not conditioned on anything. How does this work? Well, we start with the start token and then we get the probabilities distribution over the first character in text, uh, not character token, sorry, in text. And then we sample from it. If we always take the most probable one in English, it's probably always gonna be the, so it's a bit boring. So in reality, when we want to sample text, we would somehow select less probable things, or maybe we propose things that it should start from, um, right? And then we send it through the decoder and it gives us probability distribution over the next token. And we select one of them somehow, uh, and so on and so on. Um, Notice we don't have to start at the start. We could, for example, just provide the cat as tokens, as if the model had spit them out and we give those to the model and then ask the model, okay, what's the probability of the next token? And then that way we can generate conditioned on something we started with. This is called prompting. Um, another very popular one is encoder only. And the BERT is the canonical example of this. Um, so you have just the encoder part here. Uh, and so the task that you do during training, um, oh, I forgot to say for the decoder, well, that's also the task during training, right? You have this corpus of all the texts that exist or you care about, and it should provide the correct probability distribution over the next ones. Uh, and here for encoder only model, the task is uh, that from the input, we actually replace a bunch of tokens, typically 15% of them randomly with a special mask token. So we hide it. And then the task is at the output from the encoder, we want for those replaced tokens, again, the output should be probability distribution, and we want the token that is the most likely, like that was originally there to be the most likely one. And that is called the masked language modeling. We mask it and we want it to model the language like what would be in there. And then there is the other, uh, the third common way to use transformers in NLP, which is uh, in this case T5, I forgot what it stands for. Um, but this one uses the full encoder decoder model. So it kind of poses all kinds of tasks. It's a multitask model. It kind of poses all kinds of tasks as a translation. So the input could be, okay, this is a, I chose badly because it's translation input. Input could be like this, summarize and then blah, blah, blah. There's some long text here. And the translation of this would be a short summary, like a storm in Atala caused six victims. Uh, or another input could be like, is this toxic? You look beautiful today. And then the output, the translated in quotes output should be, this is not toxic uh, and so on. So you can formulate all kinds of language tasks into this like pseudo translation tasks and then just learn a transformer on that. Um, yeah, so this is the three main ways of pre-training transformers in texts. Transformers, because they are so, they have such huge capacity, this magic word, they can absorb so much data. Uh, they usually don't work at all if you use them on a small task and they, they perform terribly. And you would think, why would anybody ever use this? They work really well if you can pre-train them somehow on some huge amount of data that is somehow relevant to your task. Just somewhat relevant is enough usually. Um, and then fine tune it in some way to your exact task. Fine tune would, for the simplest way of fine tuning is just continue training on your data with a much smaller learning rate, for example. And then there are lots of advanced different techniques for fine tuning, like fine tuning some parts that the question previously hinted at and so on. 
Um, but so these are the three ways of how transformers took over language modeling and specifically the pre-training part. Now, computer vision. Um, a lot of people have tried to apply transformers on computer vision, but it kind of almost always failed because they or didn't give big advantage or anything, and then it was overcomplicated. The way people think in computer vision, you have this uh, image with pixels. So let's say each pixel is a token and the image is a sequence of tokens, uh, right? And then we just do attention on it. So basically each pixel attend to other pixels. Uh, but when you think about it, like typically in vision, we use two to four by two to four images. This is just for historical reasons, there's a typical size. Uh, but that's actually about 50,000 uh, sequence length if we see each pixel as a token. And that's crazy. Like this will blow up your memory, it doesn't fit in any memory. Uh, way too much compute, this is just not feasible. Uh, so what people have tried for a while after this is to get inspiration from convnets and somehow restrict the attention maybe to neighboring pixels. So a pixel doesn't need to look all the way to the other side from the image, but just to the pixels nearby. And there were a few papers and models like this, but they didn't really get a big advantage over convnets and they were more complicated and slower, so they didn't really take over. Um, until this paper um, in 2020, which proposed essentially a super simple idea is uh, not take the pixels as token, but consider a small patch of the image as token. For example, a 16 by 16 pixel patch, right? This, and then we can actually do attention of everything through everything. I, okay, I don't remember, think, yeah, I cannot do it in my head and I don't remember this is maybe, ah, oh, this becomes then 14 by Thank you. Yeah, that works. Okay, and I forgot the number. Oh yeah, so this becomes 14 by 14 tokens then uh, for these typical sizes, which is 100 something, almost 200, um, which is totally feasible. Like that's the same size as we have in language usually, roughly. Um, and so this is what they do. They cut the, or I should say they, I should say I'm author of this paper. So this is what we do. Uh, we cut the image into patches. And then each patch still needs to become a vector of floats, like each token in language needs to become a vector of floats. But this is simple, like the patch is 16 by 16 by three integers already. So we can just treat them as floats, or we can maybe like just matrix multiply that into, right, like with a learnable matrix, we multiply it and then we get our abstract float vectors. And these are the tokens. Um, and that's it. And then we send this through exactly the transformer encoder that you've seen before, because now it's a sequence of tokens with reasonable sequence size, right? And each token, you can see how it like roughly corresponds to something. And, and these are a little bit overblown for the visualization. 16 by 16 is actually smaller, like maybe a window here or something. Um, yeah, and then in pre-training, uh, we do supervised pre-training, but there are also unsupervised methods by now. Um, but originally it was then just take uh, one token uh, output from the transformer encoder, add a classifier on top of it, and let this one learn what is in the image, like a bird or a building or blah, 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 one of a few classes or one of a lot of classes. Um, and then this one, this is again pre-training on a lot of data because this exists in Vision, large data set where you have an image and then one class or image and then one type of label. So you can pre-train this, and then for fine-tuning, it works really well. Um, this was also mentioned in the previous talk. So shortly after that paper, we did another one, which questions is the attention even needed there? And it's not. Um, so we basically replaced the attention by a MLP, just a bunch of matrix multiplies, uh, and show that if you pre-train that at scale, it also works. Uh, so often people say, yeah, the attention is somehow magic and super special, but it's rather having a model that you can scale up and that can absorb a lot, uh, and then having a lot of data to train it on, that works. Uh, and then transformers happen to be such a model that is some, has some nice properties. Um, gonna skip the details of how, but essentially replace the attention by MRP and then 
you have this MLP mixer model. And this is an extremely simple model because it's really just matrix multiplies and nonlinearities. So this is actually a nicer to analyze model if you start digging into models. And it performs just as well as transformer on a Pareto frontier, both of whom perform better than ResNet uh, on vision tasks. But ResNet is also good. Um, right, then uh, speech. Quite similar story happened there in about the same time even. So there was this conformer model, which is a transformer with a couple convolutions sprinkled in. They are not that important, but they are there. Uh, speech, you have this uh, speech wave as a raw data. This is always transformed into this spectrogram. This is a standard speech pre-processing thing that has been done since forever. Uh, and it looks like this if you plot it. X-axis is the time, Y-axis is frequency, and color is, I don't remember. Um, and then basically what is done here to apply transformers, you essentially split it up into tokens again. Like, it's always the question, and if you want to apply transformer, how do you transform your input into a sequence of tokens that don't result in huge token length, but, or huge sequence length, but a reasonable one? And that makes sense. So in speech here, over time, you cut it into chunks and each of them, again, you project it with some learnable projection such that they become a vector. Uh, and then you can do one of the three transformer pre-trainings uh, if you want, right? Just encoder only with the uh, output being labels or generative uh, like GPT. And it's actually just recently there was a audio LM uh, paper from some colleagues that does this, like just GPT for the speech, and then you can continue the speech, uh, or multitask way with the encoder and decoder. Um, for example, the encoder could be literally like translation, take this speech and output text that corresponds to it. Um, right. And finally, reinforcement learning. I think I'm going to skip that. I No? <laughs> OK. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, there, okay, and then we go over time a bit and cut out of your lunch. Uh, no, because this, mm, I'm not sure if, who is familiar with reinforcement learning already? Ah, okay, then at least for you, if I go quickly, it may still be useful. I'm sorry for those who are not, I cannot give enough background, I think, in the time for this. Um, but I will try. Um, so, in RL, you, you want to learn a decision-making over time series. You observe a time series and then you want to take a decision, what next? And in this decision, you actually act this decision in the world, like think of a robot moving the arm, and then you continue. Uh, so you have observation and then action. And at some point, much later, you get a reward if what you have done is good or not. And there are a lot of methods that try to learn this online. Uh, while acting, you learn the model at the same time. This is called online RL, and this is not uh, where transformers are used currently. And then there is another thing that is relatively recent called offline RL, where you collect a lot of sequences of in the environment you care about. Like, let's say you have this robot arm and you just collect a lot of times the robot arm grabbing the bottle and so on, and you record everything. And then you have your data set, and on that you want to learn this decision-making model. And this is called offline RL, and this is more similar to regular uh, deep learning or supervised learning. And this is where transformers are taking over currently. And the idea is basically the yeah, think of the decoder only part, but it does have some side inputs that yeah, maybe think of encoder decoder part. Um, but it's basically you want to learn a sequence model or like a language model, but of this RL language. So in the RL language, you have a bunch of observations. Here it's shown by the Atari uh, game example. You want to play the Atari game. Um, and so first you have an observation, what do you see right now at this moment? And this somehow cut it into tokens and then you can give it to transformer. So here they do the same as uh, we propose in Vision Transformer, cut it into patches and give it to it. So you have your sequence of observation tokens. Then this is the tricky part. Um, there is the thing called return, which is over the whole episode of play, all the rewards you are gonna get from this point until the end. Um, and at training time, once you have collected all of these, you know this, right? You know the future because you collected the data. So what they decide is to put the return here as the next token. You will see later why. Um, 
and then as the next token, the action that was taken from the player or whatever, however you got your data, uh, after seeing this uh, input or observation, and then the immediate reward that you got right after this action. It may often be zero because there are sparse rewards, they only happen every now and then, uh, but if you got a reward, then the reward. And you learn this, you learn the language of this, like over your whole data set in a generative model, you learn this. And now you have, uh, once you learn this, you have actually a model that you could prompt and then ask it to generate the next tokens, right? So you show the model the observation and you just make up a return. Like you say, high return, like 5,000. And then the model gives you the probability distribution over the actions that best continue this sequence that you had in the training set, right? So it would actually sample actions from really good players from your training set. Right? Because you just put 5,000 here. Of course, if you go completely crazy out of the distribution and don't have such a good player in the training set, it's not going to work. But if you have at least a few really good players in the training set, it's going to work. Um, and this is kind of, I think, a really cool trick and that you see now more and more. If you have this autoregressive generative model with Transformer, find some way to give extra information during the training that then later at test time you just ask for. Like here, I ask for high return and boom, I get the action that leads to high return after this observation. Um, I say it as magic, as I said, it needs to be, the training data set needs to cover this and it can be hard to implement and so on, but like in principle, this is, I think, a pretty cool way. And this is called Decision Transformer in RL and it made quite some noise, but it is offline RL, not online RL. I'm not sure how much of either one will be covered in the later lectures. Um, Okay, then I'm gonna blaze through the rest though. It's not much anymore. Um, so yeah, you have seen in these various communities, basically anything you can turn into tokens and then feed into transformer and you have large data, it's good. Uh, this is gonna work well. And now the cool thing that happened very recently is, okay, why restrict to your community? Why not look around to multimodal data? Like image and text is the most recent thing, like just Put, transform the text into tokens, transform the image into tokens with this patchification and just put them both together into the model and see what happens. And this surprisingly works really well. And there have been quite a few cool papers recently, like for example here, oops, uh, taking uh, YouTube videos, uh, taking the image or sequence of images, just tokenizing them like in VIT taking the text, maybe caption that you have in YouTube or something like that, and taking the audio and just tokenizing all of it, throwing it all into a masked language uh, model kind of encoder. And then you can like just learn from this, the distribution and start generating uh, parts of it, like generate the audio that goes with this video and text, for example, or stuff like that. And you can get creative. And the communities are currently like, converging to this, trying to mix different pieces together. And it's a very creative moment in time, I think. Um, and I want to end with one note on uh, many transformer alternatives and efficient transformers because, as I mentioned a few times, as the sequence length, sequence length gets large, uh, the self-attention and cross-attention become very expensive because, you know, every token in the sequence attends to every other, so it's quadratic complexity and sequence length. So there have been a lot of works trying to propose ways around it and, like, approximations to attention that are hopefully linear and or at least not quadratic. Um, and then there was recently from some colleagues a large survey work uh, trying to first, they two papers, the first is efficient transformers survey, trying to kind of give an overview over almost all that have been proposed and grouping them into different categories, how do they try to optimize and so on. But then after this, uh, the almost same set of authors uh, made a benchmark about specifically testing how good the models are at large sequence or long sequence modeling. And this is called the long range arena. It's a key benchmark for transformers or transformer variants. And the thing they found is kind of summarized here. Uh, X axis is the speed of the model, uh, examples per second. And Y axis is the score on this long range arena, which is a whole bunch of tasks which require long sequence length. And higher is better. And what you can see is the original transformer is still, modulo this big bird is still the best. The thing is it's slow. And every alternative that has been proposed that speeds it up pays the price in terms of score. So there, there is not yet a silver bullet to make transformer faster without losing performance. Um, 
Yeah. And that's it. And I had to make this. Truly incredible talk. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of information, even the microphone couldn't catch up.